Okay, hello and welcome to my second author interview. I'm here today with the lovely William Shaw. Hi William, thank you for hello. being here. Hi, uh, lovely to be here. <laughs> William runs reading parties, which if you know me, you'll know that I've been part of that for the last few months or so, I suppose. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, so we've been having a really good time working together and now we're going to be interviewing him all about writing a series because he's got a very successful series which I'm going to talk a little bit about. I'm just going to quickly read out your bio that I've pulled from your website William so that people who don't know you will get to know you a little bit. So William Shaw's The Trawlerman is the fourth in his series set in Dungeness and featuring D.I. Alex Cupidy who originally appeared as one of his characters in his 2016 novel The Birdwatcher. William has twice been longlisted for the Thixton's Old Pe Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year and the CWA Historical Dagger and shortlisted for a Barry Award, the CWA Golden Dagger and the Golden Bullet. Before becoming a crime writer, William Shaw was an award-winning music journalist and the author of several non-fiction books. He also founded and runs the online book event strand Reading Party, which I very much enjoyed helping out with. <laughs> And just recently this year, he initiated the community bookshop, The Bookmakers, working with the charity Creative Future and Brighton and Hove City Council. So in other words, this is a very busy man. <laughs> so I guess yeah. the obvious question, William, is how do you find time to write at the same time as doing all of that? Well, I'm a very, um, I mean, it's great meeting other writers because you always assume you're doing everything wrong and doing it the wrong way. And the more longer I've been this, doing this the more writers I meet and one of the great things I learn is that everybody does it differently some people can sit down and write from 9 a.m till 5 p.m and turn out lots of words I've never been like that I sit down I might write from 9 till 9 30 and then I get up and I sort of wander around a bit and then I get distracted by the internet and then I start thinking about something else then I read a little bit of something oh and then about 11 o'clock I think oh I'm supposed to be a writer and I write some more so um I kind of think that um that suits Shoots. I've got sort of a, quite a magpie approach to um, writing. I don't, you know, the bits that I'm not writing, I don't beat myself up about because I think I'm writing somewhere in my head and that's the way my brain kind of works. So if I'm doing something else, like thinking about, um, you know, reading party or something like that, part of me is still ticking over on, on that conundrum that I've set myself in a plot where somebody's in a room and they should be 500 miles away. Um, so I think, you know, that's just the way I work. I just work in small little chunks uh, and kind of I wouldn't call it multitasking because that dignifies it with making it sound like I'm really good at it I don't that's just the way I work and I've learned to accept it and I still seem to get lots of stuff done but by doing lots of bits of stuff so having a few things to do um, doesn't distract me actually opening the bookshop probably a mistake but luckily <laughs> it closes in December and uh, my next book's, book's not due till May so I think I'll be all right on that one you'll just just be able to squeeze them both in <laughs> Um, so today we're going to be talking specifically about writing a series. Your series, the DI Alex Cupidy series, is so popular. Can you just tell us a little bit about it? Is it like, can you read them as standalones or do you have to sort of read them in one go? I really hope you can read them as standalones. I really like books where you read it as a standalone but you then find that there's more to it without being disturbed by the fact that it's not that it's part of a series. I try and make everything totally complete within the book. Um, and that's just the way I like it. Occasionally, though, you have to hint ab about things that have happened in the past. So I try and do that in an inclusive way. Like the Trawlerman is really, uh, it's kind of a sequel to the Birdwatcher book that you mentioned uh, and carries on with some of the themes in that. So you kind of got to refer to what happened in that book a little bit. Um, but I, I love the idea of them. So I, I think a book feel sort of complete. Series are great, though, because they've got this complete sort of sense. But you're part of a lot, you know, we're, we're kind of gone into mega long form reading nowadays both and mega long form television I think we kind of like you know in this world in which you nip onto Facebook one minute and do something else I think we like these really long arching narratives so um, it's when they say series these days it's not like um, you know Agatha Christie series where basically you're getting a repeat of the same sort of characters there's nothing really changes about those characters generally there are little things you might learn about somebody or other but they're kind of set in a static world what i really like about modern series is is the world's not static it gradually changes over time and and you're kind of you kind of it's almost like a saga you're writing a russian novel in little bits yeah absolutely um it's funny you used to say about the um 
sort of the overarching narrative. Um, obviously, when you're writing a book, you need to be thinking about like a character arc and like how that character is going to transform over time. So how do you sort of make sure that your characters are continuously evolving throughout multiple books rather than just through that one book? I think, you know, the, the, the trick to that is you should be very clever, but actually the real trick to that is you're probably a bit stupid. Uh, in that when I started writing series, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't even know I was writing a series. And I tend to underwrite my characters, partly because I, I uh, partly because uh, I want to have a kind of realism in it. And I don't think I know everything about everybody around me. And I certainly don't even know everything about my wife, if you know what I mean. Um, and this idea that you have to know absolutely everything about your characters kind of paralyzed me for years because I thought, well, I, I don't know everything about my characters. What am I supposed to do? But when you start writing a series, you think, well, that's actually really useful. Because if you know everything about your characters, you've got nothing to say about them in the next one. And they have nowhere to go or nowhere to change. Um, you know, in the tournament, my character has done, you know, I got one one reviewer who spotted something that my character has turned 180, 180 degrees in her life and got quite annoyed saying, it can't be, it's not the same person. Well, that's kind of the point. You know, that's kind of the point of that book. She changes. There's something she discovers about herself. Uh, and other people don't like it. And she tries to do something about it in this book. And it means quite a fundamental change in, in what her morality is. Um, and so I think you've got to leave them that space. If you know everything about them right at the beginning, you've got nowhere to go with them. And I think it's that that thing. I think one of the real tricks to writing a series fiction is to go quite light touch. Let people be real, but don't don't feel you have to know everything about them. And you don't have to know, um, you know, you've still got bits of their past you don't fully understand. And you, you certainly have bits of their future you don't understand because that leaves you space to write them. I love that. So you're like discovering the character at the same time as the readers sort of thing. Yeah, but isn't that the way with your neighbours? You move into a new house, you've got neighbours over there. Maybe they're really nice. Maybe they bring around a cup of sugar. And you think that's great. But you only know as much as you know then uh, about them. And a year later, you might know quite a lot else. And then maybe you'll, you have the same age as kids and they start going to school together and you know a lot more about them. You know, and it's that if you create that kind of character and that kind of evolution, I think it's got a lovely texture. But also... I think there's a real, you feel a real weight if you know everything about this person, you've got a real responsibility to bung it all in and that will overload um, a plot completely, you know. Yeah. Okay, so in a similar sort of vein, are you like a plotter or a pantser or somewhere sort of in between when it comes I'm to your I'm an series? absolute pantser. I'm a total pantser and I can't plot and I've tried and tried and tried and I've written a couple of books I did um, a book called Deadland I, I plotted because the I realized after I'd done my I mean I tend to write a side of A4 and that's that's my plotting um, and I, when I wrote that I realized actually uh, pretty early on we know who did it um, the trick is going to be how to keep it tense um, well, we know who did one thing at least, uh, but you know the trick is about tension, not plot. Uh, and therefore, I tried to, to to work out how to make that tense as plot as, uh, that plot as tense as it poss as possible. And that's the most I've ever planned. But I kind of wrote a draft before I wrote the plan in a weird way, uh, because. But generally, if I sit if I sit down like on on the trawler man, I sat down and I tried to write a draft, and the one I'm writing now, I tried to sit sit down and write a sort of plot rather than write write a proper thing. I can't do it. It just depresses the hell out of me. I find it really boring and I write really dull ideas down. Uh, it's only by writing them do the ideas get interesting for me. But yet again, you know, meet other writers and you find they do it differently. I've just found the most productive way for me and also the most exciting way to write for me because you've got to make your writing interesting to you is to yeah. not know what the hell I'm supposed to be doing that day. And I think that's, I kind of know where my characters have got to go by maybe the end of the chapter that I'm writing, got some sort of idea. Uh, but mainly the main idea is, is, is what happens at the end. And even then, because you're pantsing it, the end often changes. There's been two or three books when I suddenly realized, oh no, it wasn't that person who did it, it was this person. <laughs> and that's quite a nice feeling because you suddenly realize that it's completely logical. And in fact, the, I've just written a thriller and, and, and in it, my editor said, oh, I'm not sure that's about right, right. And the little light bulb came on and he said one thing and I misunderstood him completely. But when I had in my next draft, somebody completely different had turned into the baddie and he was going, oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's, how do you think of that? And I was saying, well, kind of didn't you suggest it he said no I didn't suggest that but it's <laughs> lovely the way once you've got the plot you kind of change some of the polarities of the structure and really interesting happens like you change the gender of a character or you change that person from good to bad or you change that from luck to failure or something and and all sorts of other things sort of spread out from that but you can only do that in my the way I do it once you've got to the end of a, a fairly solid first draft 
Yeah, I think that's so important. Like so many people, when they want to write books, they'll sort of look up how to do it. Like I, I did it. I, I think I Googled how to write a book when I was first starting and there's just no, no one way, is there? You've got to find what's what's right for you and what works no, for you. Absolutely not. I was just talking with Vasim Khan, who's just recorded a sort of video series of interviews for... Um, uh, Curtis Brown Creative about how to write your first novel and how how to how to finish it, and um, and I was saying this to him and said, oh dear, I've written completely just like you have to write the plot, you, you have to write the in plan. If you don't get the plan, you're nowhere. I said, well, it wouldn't apply to me. I think that's one of the things. If you're going to look at those things, read wide. It's just like read widely as well. Read outside the genre, but read at different types of how to write books. You'll find one little thing and the light bulb comes on, but other things can quite depress you um, because they're not what you do and not what you feel comfortable doing. Yeah, and that's just going to make the process harder. And it's hard enough as it is. <laughs> it's very, very, very hard. I wouldn't pretend it's otherwise, isn't it? I mean, like a book is, you know, especially first books are a mountain to climb because you kind of don't know the size of them. Um, you know what it's like to read books, but to actually turn that into something you do yourself is really hard. And, and only once you've got to the sort of end of the process and you've got something you've finished and you like, can you actually see the shape of it? So the second ones are always easier, even if you're slightly haunted by the fact like, can I do it again? But I think once you've got the shape of it, I'm a cyclist and I cycle up hills. And if I'm going up a hill I don't know, I get really tired. The second time I cycle up that hill, it's never as tiring because I kind of know where the top is. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, it totally does. Um, so sort of following on from that thread when it when you were looking to write the second book in this series did you find that easier because a lot of people say it's harder um the, uh, the second book in in this series um was that book i was talking about um deadland because i wrote so, uh, after graves end i decided i was going after bird watcher i decided i was going to pull a series out of this book and i created this character who had been in the first book and i i so i wrote salt lane and that was real fun to write and then I then I did then I wanted to write a sort of different style novel in the same series so I I turned that into a different type of novel it's a chase and um and I found that really 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 hard to write it was really difficult to use the same characters in the same settings in a different way um but um that was more hard less hard because it was the second book more that it was just a different type of thing I, mean, I didn't quite know what I was doing with it and I wasn't sure it was going to be scary enough yeah. uh, <laughs> I, but you know it was this is my second series anyway because I wrote a series set in the 60s originally um, which I is one of those classic things when you turn up uh, and there's a very keen um, agent saying oh this is great isn't it it is a series isn't it and I was going yes it's a series i hadn't thought about it being a series once but you know you kind of suddenly thought the light bulb came on oh it would be better if it's a series if she's trying to sell it um and luckily i had a couple of murders to spare so i said yeah yeah it's a series i've got three of them actually and it was going to be a trilogy and then i wrote a fourth one so all, all in my head i know exactly what's happening like <laughs> not <laughs> yeah. making it up at all just make them feel confident because i mean the, diff the the dilemma is we actually live on making things up but they live on thinking things are real to sell them you know <laughs> oh that's brilliant so um i i actually know the answer to this question already but i thought it would be a good one for for the audience to hear how did you come up with the name alex cupidy uh well i went through a phase of um looking through my facebook uh, bit where people friend you and if anybody tried to friend me and i didn't know who they were i think i'm not going to friend them but i'll leave them in that request list and i'll use that whenever i need a name so when it came along to writing the bird watcher and i needed a name for this woman i looked in that list and there was a guy called richard cupidy and i thought great i'll have that um first mistake don't ever make this mistake because then your name when she became a main character actually even the word cupidy people don't know where to say cupidy or cupidy or cupidi or cupidy uh, and they get really tripped up on that, which I don't when I'm reading a book. If somebody's got a Russian name and I can't pronounce it, I just sort of see the name visually. It doesn't, I don't have to sound it out in my head, but I realise from every time I do a, an event, somebody says, well, how do you pronounce Alex Cupidy? And I, you like, um, but I chose the name from this guy, Richard Cupidy. And then a, a couple of years into the series, I was doing an event and it was one of these um, university 3A groups. Um, and somebody said, uh, why did you choose the name Alex Cupidy? And I said, well, yeah, it's because some... Um, Da, 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 da. And he said, oh, Richard Cooper. Yeah, I know him. He lives just down there. And he was a bookseller. That's why he friended me. And I didn't accept his friend. So I quickly got on and friended him. But I've not spoken to him since, even to ask him how he pronounces his name. <laughs> I 
Oh, that's such a great story. <laughs> I love the way that people come up with character names and, and it's a bit of a trial sometimes isn't it you kind of think yeah. the name's got to fit the character and occasionally people ask you to give away competitions for your name and you try it and it's a bit of a risk because mm -hmm. you know if they win the name thing through some sort of choice you've stuck with the name and it might not fit your idea of of what the character is yeah uh, i've read books before where i've been like oh that's such a great name and then and then i really want to have a character who's got a really great name like that and it's really hard to think of it it's almost but names are technically really hard aren't they because you've got to have a name that people rem will remember through yeah. the thing but on the other hand too big a name uh especially for smaller characters will completely trip them up you know there's got to be a plausibility about some of the names um i had you know my second character is called jill ferreter which is a real name and it's existed around the area i was writing about her and it's just like you know, actually, it's quite good, that one. But it's just on the edge of being a bit too interesting as a name, isn't it? Yeah, no, I like it. It's good. Um, so in terms of writing other books that aren't part of your series, like standalones, how do you balance that? Like, how do you choose if you're going to do a, a series book next or a standalone? Well, I mean, I was in a writer's group for years, and I still am in a writer's group with, with CJ Sanson, the historical fiction writer, and he was writing a book called Dissolution. And uh, it, that was in our writers group, he's reading it. And I kind of was saying to him, you know, it's really hard to get a deal, Chris. It's really hard, you know, don't get too excited and stuff like that. And of course the first deal he gets is for like for millions. And uh, he does really, really well. And he's one of the best selling British writers. There is certainly historical fiction writers. Uh, uh, but he also said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give him two of these books and then I'm gonna write a standalone. And I said, Chris, they'll never let that happen. They'll want the series to build up. And you know, they won't just let you barge in there and say, now I'm gonna do this, now I'm gonna do that. Of course, contract was like for two, two series and his Shard Lake things and a standalone, which was Winter in Madrid. Um, and I thought it was kind of genius for the reasons he did it because he said, I'm a series writer. I don't want to get stuck in that though. I need some other way to refresh my brain and find out new bits of history and keep interested in. Um, and what happened with those two books is the first two books did all right, but Winter in Madrid was the big, big breakout hit and it was a big hit all around the world and kind of made his name. And it wouldn't, he wouldn't have got anywhere, I don't think. Well, he would have, he would have bubbled along had he not done that and then it allowed people to go back and discover how brilliant the Shard Lake series was. So I think there's two things. One, it's really good for your head to do something else, to think of another slightly different form that you're working into. And certainly with Birdwatcher, I learned so much writing that book. It taught me, that was my fourth book and I learned more writing that book than anything but the first book completely um, just because you have to think quite freshly and the second thing is it gives other people out there the readers a second chance to to um, rethink you and critics as well you're far more likely if you've done a couple of series books you're far more likely to get reviewed if you do a standalone I mean uh, I had this conversation for years with Ellie Griffiths and then she wrote the postscript murders and of course the postscript murders allowed her to go on sort of all sorts of you know Richard and Judy stuff and things like that because suddenly she wasn't writing a series despite that she was telling huge amounts by then it gave people another excuse to revisit her uh, apart from the fact that it was obviously great fun to write and to read yeah yeah I suppose if, if they're reading a standalone and they enjoy it they might then go oh they've written a series I'm going to read the whole series so it's kind yeah. of like a nice introduction to you yeah and I think you know like some places that haven't stocked you find it a bit hard or haven't championed you find it a bit hard to start halfway through a series but standalone gives them the chance to buy in so you know they can do that and, and include you into things and up from there it's at the wedge to get inside people's heads <laughs> oh that's brilliant so um can you just tell us a little bit about what's next for you what's coming up in terms of your writing and other things that you're doing well i'm writing a cupidy book which probably won't come out for a few years now because i'm also writing a, a thriller that's um, out next year is called Dead Rich and um, it's coming out next May and it's it's very I've just been doing the copy edit it's quite good and I think if you like something when you write, when you read the copy edit which is the most tedious job in the world and you think actually that's, that's all right um, then it then uh, it probably is all right <laughs> um, so I'm very excited about that one um, and then I'll be writing another thriller based on that so it's a, it's, it's kind of different genre uh, just to have a little bit of a, a breather from the, the um, Cupid books, but there's one underway. Um, so that will happen too. Fantastic. And then the way that I finish these interviews, um, just to put you on the spot a little bit, is if you had one bit of advice for a aspiring author, what would it be? 
Well, it's the really obvious one is finish. And it doesn't really matter how bad it is to just finish because it's like when I was reading, when I was finishing The Bird Watcher, I had right, I got to the right last section and all sorts of light bulbs came out on about what the book was going to be about. I've been struggling all the way through and only right at the end did it really come together because you can always make something that's a bit crap better, but you can't make a blank page better. And it's just no, nobody wants, there are no great bestsellers of half written books. Um, <laughs> no, unless it's posthumously and, you know, you're, you know, somebody else famous finishes it, you know, um, but um, it's, it's that, thing is finished which is a real slog but you know also the other thing is like 300 words a day is a novel in a year um and 300 words a day isn't very don't get put off by all these people say i've just written 2000 words a day i never write 2000 words a day unless i'm desperate i just can't do it um little and often just but get to the end be the tortoise not the <laughs> hare absolutely i totally agree with that well, thank you so much for joining us, William. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And I will leave all of the details of William's books down below so you can go and check them out if you haven't read them already. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your week. Thank you, Becca. It's been brilliant. Thank you.